it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I come from Houston, where anything more than 40 years old is considered ancient. To be here in Israel, where anything 4,000 years old is just yesterday, uh, it's quite a contrast. So what I'll talk about in the next 20 minutes are three patients that or sort of represent the different ends of the spectrum of valve disease. An asymptomatic patient with severe disease and two uh, very symptomatic patients with far advanced disease that I think offer us the greatest challenge uh, in trying to decide what the best management strategy is. So here's a 71-year-old man who feels well and says he can do whatever he wishes that he's asymptomatic um, he has a typical physical examination of aortic stenosis and goes to the echo lab uh, where a 4.3 uh, meter per second jet is detected across the aortic valve. Uh, he has a mean transvalvular gradient of 60, a valve area of 0.8. His ejection fraction is preserved and he has heavy calcification of his aortic valve. Uh, and the question is then what to do with this asymptomatic patient with severe aortic stenosis. We know that if he truly is asymptomatic, at least his short-term course is pretty good. Uh, Pat Pelica at the Mayo Clinic uh, looked at 622 patients with known severe disease because they had echoes and their average jet velocity was 4.5, very much like this gentleman. And censoring them when they developed symptoms, the outcome was not really any different statistically from a reference population. They actually did um, very well. And um, Raphael Rosenheck in Vienna, uh, following a smaller group of patients, 116, uh, there was only one sudden death in asymptomatic patients in six years. And if you look at the roughly 1,200 patients, which is really the totality of all the asymptomatic patients in the literature that have been followed, the risk of sudden death in the asymptomatic patients, about a half a percent per year, pretty small. And yet there still is worry. Because in Dr. Pelica's study, there were 11 patients who did die suddenly without symptoms. And if you look in the literature, there are another group of patients who move very rapidly from being asymptomatic to symptomatic to dead. And anybody that's followed a large number of these patients for any period of time is likely to have one tragedy. Uh, that makes you feel terrible, the family feel terrible, and of course, the patient's dead. So what to do? We could operate, and the operative outcome for such a patient today is fantastic. If you look at the SDS risk score for the patient that I just presented, his operative risk is less than 1%. And there's only about a 7% chance that he'd have anything uh, significantly bad happening to him in the post-operative period. So it kind of puts us between a rock and a hard place. He's low risk to wait for symptoms, but he's also low risk to operate, and that's why the decision about what to do with him is somewhat difficult. So I think the best strategy is, I think the best strategy is probably to come up to develop a group of higher than average risk aortic stenosis patients for whom it makes more sense to operate than to wait. So um, we know from Catherine Otto's data that if your patient with aortic stenosis enters your office with normal LV function with a jet velocity of three or less, there's only a 10% chance that he'll need a valve in five years. But like this patient, if the patient comes to your office with a jet velocity of greater than four, there's a 70% chance that he'll need a valve in just two years. And Rosenheck really demonstrated the same thing, taking it a few steps further. If your patient has a jet velocity of more than five, he probably won't even make it one year without a valve, and then that raises the issue, well, what are you waiting for? This patient is very likely to need a valve in the next two years anyway. Why not go ahead and operate? And there's a 
I think there's logic to that argument. Rosenheck also demonstrated that the more heavily the valve is calcified, the more rapidly it progresses. The plaques in the valve of aortic stenosis are hot. They're inflamed. There are, there are plaques in the valve of aortic stenosis that can be one degree Fahrenheit hotter than the rest of the valve. So this is a sea of inflammation, and the amount of calcium in the valve reports to us how severe the inflammatory process is, and therefore how rapidly that valve is proceeding on uh, to a, a, a situation that will cause death. And then the question is, is the patient truly asymptomatic? Patients lie. Well, they don't do it on purpose. They learn to tailor their lifestyles to keep themselves asymptomatic, which is why I exercise every asymptomatic patient with any kind of valvular heart disease if they can exercise. Now, you're crazy to exercise a patient with symptoms. That patient needs to be in the operating room having his valve replaced. But the asymptomatic patient is going to exercise anyway. And it makes sense to have him or her do that exercise in front of us so that we can observe how they're doing. And this study by Dawson colleagues supports that. Those patients who had an exercise test in which the patients achieved 75% of their age-predicted exercise tolerance and had a normal rise in blood pressure, a year later were still doing well. Whereas those patients who failed their test had a fall in blood pressure or gave out early, a year later, 50% of them required an aortic valve replacement for standard reasons. BNP is probably helpful. It's bad, I think, to see it going up. It's just that no one has arrived at a BNP to help you, and, and everyone who's looked at BNP has a slightly different cutoff value for what number you might use to prescribe an aortic valve replacement. Um, and then finally, left ventricular hypertrophy. If When it's severe, it's bad. And this um, uh, propensity match study by Duncan and colleagues in which 964 patients without severe LVH were matched to 964 patients with severe LVH that underwent an aortic valve replacement. <clears throat> Those patients who went to the operating room with severe hypertrophy had twice the operative mortality and twice the operative morbidity uh, than did patients without it. It's interesting that in the 98 American guidelines, I was offering those, we said that LVH was a 2B indication for an aortic valve replacement. In 2006, that disappeared. I think we just forgot it. Um, you know, the, the guide, these are guidelines, you know. They're not commandments. 75% of the U.S. guidelines for valve disease are based on consensus of opinion, not on fact, not on evidence. So what to do with this guy? Well, I exercise him. <clears throat> he quit after three minutes uh, and looked terrible and underwent an uneventful aortic valve replacement the six months after which he said, you know, Doc, <clears throat> if I had known how well I was going to feel, after this operation, I'd had it done three years ago. And in fact, he was probably symptomatic for several years before he wound up uh, getting his aortic valve replaced. So in terms of this disease, symptomatic AS remains one of the most lethal diseases in all of medicine. And once patients develop symptoms, they begin to die at the rate of 2% per month or 25% per year. I think for the asymptomatic group, who are generally safe, we can identify those patients that are higher than average risk that could benefit from an aortic valve replacement early, and those are people with a high jet velocity, a positive exercise tolerance test, heavy calcium in the valve, LVH, and probably a rising BNP. <clears throat> Shifting gears. 76-year-old guy that gets out of breath brushing his teeth in the morning. 
two over six systolic ejection murmur, goes to the echo lab, only has a mean gradient of 19, an ejection fraction of 19% and a valve area of 0.9. He has this triad of low gradient, low output, low ejection fraction. And we looked at this um, group of patients with these low gradients several years ago there are two ways of having a low ejection fraction in aortic stenosis. One is from afterload mismatch, and that's this group of patients here. This is afterload um, uh, on, on the horizontal axis and ejection fraction on the vertical axis. And as afterload goes up, ejection fraction goes down. In the operating room, the surgeon replaces the valve, the hole gets bigger, the afterload goes away, and almost immediately the ejection fraction will improve. But these guys, like the patient I just presented, have their reduced ejection fraction not based on afterload excess, but rather because they have a shot ventricle. Afterload excess does not explain the low ejection fraction. These people have intrinsic severe myocardial dysfunction. Trulubia and his colleagues pointed out that there's low gradient and very low gradient. And for patients like this whose gradients are less than 20, the operative risk was more than 30%. And it's especially true, like this patient, if the reason the ejection fraction is so low is not only because of the aortic stenosis, but because of multiple myocardial infarctions. Dead meat don't beat. And putting a valve in a patient that's got large areas of scar in the myocardium are not going to help that patient very much. Inotropic reserve is a very useful tool in assessing operative risk. So when Monin and colleagues did that, those patients who had an increase in stroke volume of 20% per more, that's group one during the infusion of dobutamine, had an operative risk of only 10%. And most were doing well five years later. They did much better than this group of patients treated medically. They also did much better than group two patients. Group two patients failed to have inotropic reserve and their operative risk was 30%. Inotropic reserve tells you about operative risk, but it doesn't tell you about long-term outcome. So when they followed these patients up, the group two patients, these are the folks without inotropic reserve, 30% of them have died at surgery, but for the 70% who survived, they had every bit as great an improvement in ejection fraction postoperatively as the group one patients. And what I take from those data are that inotropic reserve helps you get through the operation, but it doesn't tell you which ventricles are going to recover and which ventricles can't recover uh, after surgery. So what this guy has every risk factor against him that you could imagine. Low gradient, less than 20, no inotropic reserve, very high BNP, um, and also a 76-year-old man that really didn't want to undergo surgery. So we treated him medically. He died two years later. Was that the right thing to do? I have no idea. I think this is a group of patients that we still don't know very much about. Suppose we could treat this patient tra trans catheter. Suppose we could put the valve in without surgery. You know, if you look, these are partners B, the data that I'm sure you've all seen a hundred times, and we know that a trans catheter valve uh, against medical therapy has a 50% increase in survival. The patients like mine were excluded from that trial. So we don't know exactly how they would have done. The transcatheter valves are very nice hemodynamically, and they have a, almost no gradient across the valve, and that's good. And in this, these were not, Clavel from Quebec did not study the low gradient, low EF, but they did study the low EF patients. 
And actually, the the folks that got a TAVR did better than the folks that got that had a standard aortic valve replacement in terms of recovery of ejection fraction. So it may be that TAVR would have been a great idea for this patient. We'll have to see. I still think there are some ventricles that just can't ever recover uh, with this syndrome, and I don't think we know who they are yet. Uh, but that gives you some ideas about how to go about sorting it out. Finally, this 75-year-old man who's had three MIs. He's in class three heart failure and ejection fraction of 22%, and he has severe functional mitral regurgitation. And the question is what to do with him. Um, we know that in far, uh, MR in heart failure reduces prognosis. And in Tricon's data, this black line are folks with heart failure without MR, and these are folks with heart failure and mild MR, and these are folks with heart failure and more severe MR. We know that the presence of mitral regurgitation in heart failure worsens prognosis. What we don't know is whether it's cause and effect. Because another way of looking at these same data are that the MR is simply reporting to you how sick the ventricle is. And the sicker the ventricle, the more MR the patient has. If you have two patients and they each have an ejection fraction of 35%, but one has severe MR, that's a much worse ventricle. Remember that in organic MR, the cutoff for operation is 60%. There's no other heart disease where we consider 60% abnormal. But it is in MR because the normal ejection fraction is about 70% because MR engenders ejection. And the same is true for functional MR. So if, if you, if, if the question then is how do you sort out whether it's the MR that's contributing to mortality or whether it is just telling us how bad the ventricle is? Well, I think it is, it's neither one or the other. There are some patients in whom the MR is truly bad and fixing it's a good idea and there's some patients with MR in whom it's just there, but it's the ventricle that's the overall and overriding problem. Um, you know, if the MR is really the cause of the worsened prognosis, it should be relatively easy to prove. Fixing it should make you live longer and feel better. That's what happens in every other valve disease. When you fix aortic stenosis, the patients feel better and live longer. When you fix organic MR, the patients feel better and live longer. But in functional MR, it's been hard as hell to prove that anything we've done makes a difference. So in this study by Harris and all, there was no difference in patients with functional MR from coronary disease, whether they had bypass alone or bypass plus a valve, a valve operation. In these data from the University of Michigan, um, where uh, this whole idea of a restrictive uh, annuloplasty was sort of started by Steve Bowling, there was really no difference in outcome between those folks that received an operation and those folks treated medically. From the Cleveland Clinic, uh, there was no difference. There are two lines here, but they're almost right together. In patients with functional MR from coronary disease that received bypass alone versus bypass and a mitral operation. Um, and in Benedetto's meta-analysis of over 2,500 patients, he couldn't find all the sort of all the uh, reports in the literature. He couldn't find any difference in mortality or even an improvement in symptoms um, after a operation for functional mitral regurgitation. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't patients that would benefit. I'm sure there are. We haven't figured out the way to tell who they are yet. And I think that is our, our next big hurdle to cross. We all say this is a ventricle, ventricular problem, which it is. It's the ventricle that's causing the MR. But we have no way yet to fix the ventricle. 
And until we can fix it, our therapy has been aimed at fixing the MR, and perhaps these less invasive ways of doing it are a good approach. Indeed, the clip is being used mostly both in America um, and overseas uh, to treat functional mitral regurgitation. So improved surgery over the last 50 years has allowed us to operate safely and earlier on patients like that patient with aortic stenosis, uh, who would probably do better with surgery than without. Uh, it also allows us to operate on patients we never would have dreamed of operating on 20 or 30 years ago because surgery has gotten so much better. Um, and these have certainly broadened the spectrum of what we can do. We still have some questions that we have to answer about this group of diseases. On top of that, the less invasive percutaneous approaches are going to be real challenges for us. And I think it's crucial that we, uh, as cardiologic societies, do not let the genie out of the bottle again, that we look at these new approaches to valvular heart disease with caution, a team approach using the heart team, a collection of heart surgeons and cardiologists and other uh, uh, interested parties to make the best decision about to what to do for the patient. Thank you very much for your attention.